Good evening. We are officially finished the group stage of the 2023 African Cup of Nations here in La Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, and the round of 16, the knockout stages, are set to officially begin. My name is Maher Mizahi. I'm the host of this African Five Aside podcast, which is actually uh, an AFCON diary, day 12, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by www.africasacountry.com. Do go to the website and check it out because uh, we have some interesting articles coming up on the AFCON, uh, ones that I think everybody's going to enjoy, um, about the Ghanaian Black Stars, for example, and their debacle. Uh, I might write something about Algeria and Tunisia there too, so so do check out the website. I think you're going you're gonna to like it. But this is an AFCON diary, so we're going to recap the uh, matches of the day. Today we had three nil-nils. And, you know, me, Group E, I always expected a bunch of nil-nils. I was surprised we didn't have more coming into today. But we had Namibia draw with Mali nil-nil. South Africa draw with Tunisia nil-nil. Tanzania draw with DR Congo nil-nil. And then Morocco beat Zambia 1-0. I watched Tunisia versus South Africa. And I watched Morocco versus Zambia. So those are the matches that I'm going to be talking about. Let's start with the first match, Tunisia versus Mali. Um, Tunisia came into the match needing to win to progress. South Africa just needed a draw to progress. Um, South Africa came. South Africa came into the match without making any changes in their starting lineup, and Tunisia, I believe, just made one change. They brought in the striker uh, Seyfeddine Jaziri, who came in for uh, Youssef Msekni, who was playing more of a false nine role against Mali in the previous match. So. Knowing that Tunisia needs a goal, you're expecting them to take control of the match and take it to the South Africans, especially, especially later on in the match. You know, it's one of those things where I can understand them not going all out, you know, in the first half because then you're going to tire yourself out. And if you need a, you know, a goal in the second half, you don't want to be uh, completely and utterly exhausted. But the first half happens. South Africa uh, control, you know, ball possession, control the number uh, of scoring opportunities. Uh, let me just take a look at some quick statistics. Um, in the first half, it was actually pretty even. Total shots, 6-5 to five to Tunisia. Um, big chances missed, 1-0 to Tunisia. Tunisia made 180 passes and South Africa made 130. Uh, the second half was also very, very even. 6-5 to five shots for South Africa, 2 shots on target for South Africa to 0 and 168 passes to South Africa, 186 to Tunisia. So very, very even match, actually. Uh, it seemed for some reason to me that South Africa were better in possession, but I think that's because when South Africa had possession, they seemed to have some purpose to it. They seemed to be um, building something, constructing something. And, you know, South Africa started, as I mentioned, with the similar, ver the exact same team as last time, which meant eight and a half Sundowns players, right? The eight Sundowns players plus Percy Tau. So there's a, a huge amount of uh, complementarity. There's a huge amount of chemistry between the players. They know each other very, very well. And so the combinations that they were playing was very, very pleasing to the eye. Tunisia, especially in the second half, I can only recall like one major occasion, maybe two. And it came from uh, the fullbacks, Ali Abdi and Wajdi Kashrida. I think it was Kashrida. Or was it? No, it was Al Taif that put in a cross and Haytham Zouni mistimes his header, ball goes over the bar. Um, but really, really, the one thing that shocked me the most from this match is that, again, Tunisia have to win. Tunisia have to, everybody knew Tunisia has to win. To win, you have to score a goal. And not only were Tunisia not creating chances, I didn't sense any urgency from the players or from the coaching staff. Yesterday when Algeria was playing and they were losing 1-0, I felt a huge amount of urgency from the players, even though they were completely hapless. You know, they were doing absolutely nothing, playing long balls uh, that Mauritania were clearing with ease. There weren't too many clear-cut chances. Tunisia, there weren't clear-cut chances, but they weren't... Again, I was sensing a lack of urgency. Even things like the ball goes out for a throw, nobody's like sprinting over to take it out for a throw... Uh, they're not complaining to the ref about additional time. You know, all these things, like, it felt like they they thought that a draw would be enough for them to go through, even though I know that's not the case, and they know that's not the case. And I think that was the most shocking thing to me, was the lack, complete and utter lack of urgency from the Tunisian national team. 
<clears throat> Tunisia goes home now, uh, eliminated like <laughs> like Algeria, like their neighbors, and the the coach in the post match press conferences announced that he is going to be uh, resigning from his post, um, which I think is logical, right? If you listen to our Tunisia preview on this channel, uh, the coach was never somebody that coached in a big four uh, club in Tunisia. He wasn't somebody that came with a huge CV. He got his job because he stepped in for uh, his his coach, Mundar Kabeir, because he was the assistant coach at for Tunisia at the previous AFCON. And when he stepped in, they got a 1-0 result against Nigeria uh, in the round of 16 or the quarterfinals, I believe, in the round of 16. And then immediately after that, he qualifies uh, Tunisia to the World Cup. But he qualifies them on an own goal, right? They didn't even score a goal to go to the World Cup. So scoring goals has been a huge problem for Tunisia uh, really over the last 18 months to two years. Uh, in their six matches in major competitions, uh, you know, the World Cup and, and this AFCON, they've scored two goals, uh, which is simply not enough. The one against Mali in this competition and the one against France um, in the World Cup. So there's a few different reasons, I think, why Tunisia uh, haven't been able to score so many goals. Number one, they're lacking a number nine. We've been saying that, you know, uh, in the in the preview uh, we said that in the preview on this channel, we said that really over the last, let's say almost a decade, Tunisia has been missing a really good striker for a very, very long time. The last real good striker that they could count on in big competitions is probably Francis Ludo Santos, who's of Brazilian heritage. Um, it's not like the Tunisians uh, produced a player like that from their ranks. Uh, they, I'm not saying that, like all the other strikers were crap. There was like Taha Yassin Khanisi. There have been a few decent ones, you know. Uh, Haytham Zwini, I think, is not horrible, um, especially with what he's been doing with that Tunisian this year in Tunisia. But on top of the fact that they are lacking a true spearhead and a number nine, again, it's it's the coaching, the style of play that's a big big problem. Uh, they're not creating chances because Morocco also, in my opinion, lack a true goal scoring number nine. Youssef Nasiri is a good player. Uh, Ayoub El Kabi is a good player, but it's not. They're not like the Victor Osimhen level. I would even throw Baghdad Bounijah up there. Uh, there are a few different, like Vincent Aboubakar. You know, those are they're on another level, in my opinion. Um, but still, Morocco creates chances. You know, they'll, they'll have, and we'll talk about this in a second. But you know, the passing combinations, uh, that triangle, for example, Ziyech, Unahi, Hakimi. And how many occasions they procure up that right flank. You don't see that from Tunisia. And it's a big, big coaching problem. Here's a statistic for you that's kind of haunting for the Carthage Eagles. In the three matches that Tunisia played in this African Cup of Nations, they have a total XG of 1.98. That is less than Emilio Nsou by himself, Baghdad Bounijah by himself, Victor Osman by himself, and Percy Tau by himself. So for that, less than four players, them as a total team have less XG. And in the post ma in the mix zone post match, Naim Sliti, you know, who's one of the veterans of this Tunisian national team, also spoke about the fact that they don't create enough goals. And he says we would like to play more offensive. We need to play more offensive. Well, even when we do have success, like at the previous Afcon, he says uh, we always like qualify with only three points. Um, he, you know, the World Cup, they qualify with an own goal. It's too tight. You know, he says like Tunisia, the rest of the continent is catching up and Tunisia, we're stagnating. We need to create more. We need to play more attacking. And that seemed like a criticism of the coaching staff, even though he wasn't trying to be mean, but it seemed like there's a recognition within the group that they need to change their style of play. So that's the positive. The positive is that at least they know what the problem is, maybe unlike Algeria. Um, the other positive, in my opinion, is that for Tunisia, unlike Algeria, um, there are coaching candidates that I think are ready, hot and ready for, for ready to deliver. Um, Mehdi Nafti, former Tunisian international with extensive coaching experience in the second division in Spain. Radij Aidi, uh, spent almost a decade at Southampton under 23s, um, coached in the United States, I believe is an assistant coach in Belgium now, if I'm not mistaken, has also coached one of the big four in Tunisia, uh, Esperance de Tunis. I know his time there wasn't a, a, a raving success, 
But it seemed like when he speak to Tunisians that spoke to him there, he needed time. He came to Esperance de Tunis with a project in mind of this is what I need to do over the next two, three years. And Esperance fans, or, you know, like any fans of a very big club in Africa, like Esperance or Widad or El Ahli, it's not about a three-year vision for them. It's like, no, we have to win trophies every single year. But with the Tunisian national team, we have 18 months now prior to the next AFCON. We have a good three years ahead of the next w- three years. No, two years. Or just two, two years and a half. That's it. Before the next World Cup. And so there's a little bit of time to create a project. And I think Radij Aidi could be the man to do it. He has you know, Premier League experience, very, very uh, respe- well respected as a former coach. Those are my two names that come to the top of my head. And Tunisia, they have a lot of great coaches. You know, they produce probably per capita the greatest number of coaches in Africa and the greatest number of physios or, uh, yeah, physios in Africa. Or what do you call those? Like uh, strength and conditioning coaches, you know? So that's the good news for Tunisia is that, you know, you don't, with a national team, you just need to really have a good coach, a good maybe technical director and a good staff. You don't necessarily need to have a great stadium and an academy and all of that. So um, I think Tunisia can get this turned around pretty quickly. They just need to find um, a striker, really. Uh, maybe convince some of the players from the diaspora to, to come and play. Uh, Hannibal Mezuri missed this tournament, get him back on. Even the key players for Tunisia are not at an age where they're ready to retire like Algeria. I know I keep drawing comparisons, but it's... For me, it's it's it has value drawing these comparisons. Algeria has Ilad Mahrez, who's too old, Raiz Mbarhi, who's too old, Islam Slimani, Baghdad Bounijah, Isa Mondi. These are all players, you know, that are probably past their prime. Whereas with Tunisia, Montessar Talbi is your man in defense. Uh, Ali Abdi as left back. Um, Isa Al Aidouni, uh, Elias Khiri, Hannibal Mejbri. Uh, what's his name? Uh, new, new winger from Copenhagen, Al Ashouri. Uh, these are all very, very, you know, young players who are probably entering their prime over the next two years. And so I think Tunisia can get this turned around quickly, unlike Algeria, which I think is going to take a little more time. But overall, logical elimination for the Carthage Eagles. I think South Africa deserved to go through. Um, and I'm excited to see what South Africa do. I think Evidence Mahopa is slowly growing into this tournament as a target man. And again, the, the football that they play has purpose. It has uh, coherency. And I think... As a result, South Africa are going to be a handful for, uh, is it Morocco that they're playing next? Yeah, Morocco in the in the round of 16. Yes, Morocco and San Pedro. Okay, so let's talk about Morocco. Let's talk about that second match, Morocco versus Zambia. Uh, Walid Regragi was suspended for this match. Uh, we talked about what happened between him and Chancellor Mbemba. Again, I, I really didn't think it was a, a question of racism, but CAF decided to suspend him four matches. Uh, it's really o- only a two-match suspension, and then two matches are... are a suspended sentence, uh, meaning that if he gets in trouble again, they'll be enforced. But if he doesn't get suspended again, they'll be expunged within a year. Uh, so he missed this match and he'll miss the next match against South Africa. Rashid bin Mahmoud comes in and he was the interim coach f- uh, for this match. Made a few different changes. Uh, the Moroccans did. Uh, Yahya Hafiyatullah came in at left back. We, again, we said a sort of mentioned that at the last AFCON diary when we said Shibi, Mohamed Shibi is probably not going to start another game for Morocco at left back because of the mistakes he made against DR Congo. Yunus Abdel Hamid made his AFCON debut at the age of 36 years old. A uh, very consistent defender playing for Reims. I like him a lot, and I think uh, I was very happy for him to see him make his debut. Uh, Saibari from uh, PSV Eindhoven, who usually actually plays probably in a little more advanced role for his club, uh, also started this match. Uh, more as a number eight alongside Azdin Unahi in that sort of Salim Amalah role. I think he was really good, actually. So Morocco, as, as they do in all three matches, they start really strong. Um, they've started strong in all three matches. That's something to, to keep in mind for, for the next match against South Africa. Uh, they create many different chances. And we talked about, you know, those combinations that they create. There's that triangle of Hakimi, Ziyech, and Unahi that is... So good. I want to say it's world class. It probably is world class. We, I mean, they, they, they had success at the World Cup. And it's good because, you know, Ziyech finds space wherever he needs it, whether it's deeper or on the wing. And Hakimi takes that inside track and sort of drives through. And Unahi is just the, the, the glue and uh, the link-up play there. Um, 
I thought Sebari did a, another, you know, he was also very, very good right next to um, Unahi, as was Amir Richardson when he came on in the second half. So the, Morocco have, uh, you know, extensive amount of center ha- central midfielders if they need. Um, the problem with Morocco, though, so they created a lot of chances in the first half. Uh, they scored a goal in the first half, if I'm not mistaken, as well, from open play this time. So... <laughs> I, we kept saying that you know we can't just rely on set pieces. We can't, and uh, Ziyech provided you know like a lot of great opportunities from set pieces. There was that one great trick set piece where Hakimi sort of passes it to him and he took it quickly. And Naifa could have just missed the the frame by by a few feet. Um, so Hakimi's you know he's still very or excuse me Ziyech is still very uh, much a threat from set pieces and from crosses, which is good news for Morocco. And I think that's going to be absolutely crucial in the knockout stages. But they scored from set pe- from a, a, an open play this time. It was Sofiane Bufal, ball over the top on a diagonal to Hakimi, who hits in a low cross. Ayub al Kabi rushes to meet it, uh, clashes with the goalkeeper, no foul. And Hakim Ziyech follows it in and, and strikes the ball, and it's in. Um, so Morocco scored in the first half. They dominated the first half. The problem, I thought, was that uh, Hakim Ziyech picked up an injury, so we have to keep an eye on that. Hopefully, for Morocco, that's not too mu- too serious of an injury. But in the second half, we noticed uh, a fall off from Morocco, as we did in the DRC match. And I'm not going to be overly critical here because Morocco were qualified for the knockout stages, even if they lost this match. Um, so, and they were winning one nil, and they, you know half the starting lineup is not playing anymore. Ziyech is out. F- being complacent is normal to me. You know, uh, you don't want to kill yourself and pick up you know a hamstring injury. When you're already qualified, yeah. So we'll continue to monitor that and see if it's a problem in the round of 16 against South Africa. But I don't want to be too harsh and say that it's a big problem that Morocco fell off in the second half. Um, didn't really create too many opportunities at all. And Zambia did actually create some opportunities. I uh, don't have too many notes about for Zambia. I thought they they were set up okay. Patson Daka, like Victor Osimen in this tournament, has been missing way too many clear cut opportunities. And Baghdad Bunijah as well, even though Bunijah has three goals. Uh, or had three goals. Now he's home. But um, Pats and Daka, that's I think one of the things I was a little bit disappointed with. Lamek Banda on the left flank I thought was great for Zambia. Uh, he's such an exciting prospect. I think he's just 22 years old playing for Lecce in Serie A. Uh, Chalufia was okay. Kangwa was okay. Sunzu, nah. I think it's about time he probably retires. Um, thought, yeah. I don't know. The best player for me was probably Lamek Banda. I thought he brought the most amount of danger uh, for the Zambians. So not much to say for Zambia. I think overall a disappointing tournament for them. But again, they are a nation, as mentioned uh, in, in their preview, that really has probably an overinflated image of what they should be because they've had so much success in the past. So hopefully this is a building block for them and they can do better in, in future competitions. I hope so. At least I like the copper bullets. So um, after the match, I watched this match in Trishville with a friend. Uh, Trishville, for those that don't know, is um, a district in Abidjan, southern Abidjan. Uh, and it's made up of like grids, you know. So it's like streets, uh, I don't know, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then Avenue, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, blah, blah, blah. Up, all the way up to 20s or whatever. It's very much perpendicular streets. And uh, and what's great about this dist- district is that there are so many different you know communities living here, uh, Senegalese, Malians, Burkinabis, so many different, and obviously Ivorians. And immediately after Morocco uh, won one nil, you just hear fireworks, people beeping, those air horns, and then the one thing that I love about <laughs> West and Central Africa is um, the celebration of. <laughs> just running down en masse in the street as a sort of stampede, you know, just like running and singing. I tried, I tried keeping up with them. I haven't been running for a while. <laughs> I've been mostly, you know, sitting in the press boxes. So as I told my friend Alex who's with me. I told him, you know what? I'm going to try to run with them. <laughs> I went and they ran for like three kilometers. I could go for like a, a kilometer, a kilometer and a half. I started cramping up in my side Ah, but they were like, everybody that saw me was like, thank you so much, you know, yeah, Morocco, thank you so much. I told them, I'm not Morocco, I'm Algerian. Yeah. They said, yeah, it doesn't matter, same thing, thank you anyway. So thank you, Morocco, for, for 
getting people to thank me and, and to appreciate me in a random streets in Trushville uh, in Abidjan. Uh, but it was great to see Ivorian celebrate, and it kind of gave a second win to this tournament. I think uh, there was a real uh, fear that with the host knocked out in the group stages, a lot of the enthusiasm that you have here in the city uh, would die down, and that wouldn't have been you know, a good thing. But it's been quite the contrary. I think Ivorians now, <laughs> they're saying, this is from God. You know, <laughs> We just needed to get the, the French manager, Jean-Louis Gasset, out of here. We have a new manager now. We have a new lease on life. The players are scared. They know what to do now. This is a sign from God that we're going to win this thing. So uh, it was good to see the enthusiasm from the Ivorians. I really appreciated that. Um, that's it, though. We're finished the group stages. Wow, I can't believe it. It's been, uh, it's, been, it's been really great. I think this has been the most enjoyable edition of the African Cup of Nations that I can remember since I've followed you know, the African Cup of Nations seriously. Um, as a young man, so it's been fantastic. The this, the country has been fantastic. I really, really recommend you come out here if you've never uh, been to an Afcon, um, and the the fun is just beginning. Just gonna do a quick rundown because I know I'm taking up a lot of time here. We're at 21 minutes in, so let's do a quick rundown of what the round of 16 is gonna look like. We have Nigeria versus Cameroon at Felicia in Abidjan. We have Angola versus Namibia in Bouaké. We have Egypt versus DR Congo in San Pedro, Equatorial Guinea versus Guinea in Ebimpe. We also have Cape Verde versus Mauritania, also in Felicia, and then Morocco versus South Africa in San Pedro, Mali versus Burkina Faso in Corhogo, and Senegal versus Cote d'Ivoire in Yamoussoukro. Um, looking at this round of 16, I think a lot of the heavyweight teams are going to be uh, feeling very confident. For example, a Nigeria Cameroon, they're going to say, you know, if we can just get past Cameroon or if we can just get past Nigeria, we'll have one of Angola or Namibia waiting for us in the quarterfinals. You know, and with all due respect to those two countries, and again, we saw the lessons of underestimating your opponent at this AFCON. That's why Angola and Namibia are where they are. Um, I do think these larger sides, however, are going to feel like, you know, if we can just get past a round of 16 match, we have an easy ticket to the semifinals. Another example would be Morocco versus South Africa. The winner of that match is looking at Cape Verde versus Mauritania and saying, ah, you know what, we can we can have an easy ticket to the semifinals as well. Cape Verde uh, probably played the best football in the tournament alongside Senegal, but Mauritania are a side that, you know, um, I think Morocco or South Africa would feel very confident against. Um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. We still have two or three days to digest all of what happened over the last... Uh, almost two weeks now and uh, I'm going to do uh, probably I'm going to continue these AFCON diaries daily I'm probably going to do a team of the of the group stages tomorrow and then maybe I'm going to do um, a sort of rundown or lessons learned from for the teams that were eliminated uh, kind of like what we did for Tunisia today and maybe we could do one for you know Algeria maybe we could do one for Ghana uh, we could also do one for um, Tunisia as well, Zambia, Tanzania. So that could be something worth doing as well. It's only six were eliminated. And of those six, you have Ghana, Algeria, and Tunisia. So great AFCON. Anyways, I'm going to leave it here for tonight. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you do appreciate these podcasts, remember to subscribe uh, on YouTube. Uh, or you can you know, follow the podcast on any really audio platform, whether it's Spotify, streaming, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Um, you can find it. Just subscribe. And uh, we're going to continue covering the AFCON. Yeah. Thanks. Good evening. And we'll speak to you tomorrow. Peace.